Today's super review is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Enjoy the video! So, what is this new dragon's deal? Do you dare enter this dragon's den? Only this time, no suits. Or cash. But there is a dragon. That's right everyone, Dragon Ball Super the Manga Chapter 70 is here, and what we're about to witness is something pretty big for the state of Dragon Ball, in that this actually has some sort of consequence, for once, that otherwise might not have happened prior to these days. Dragon Ball is evolving. I am reading the manga via Viz's online portal, and you can too by going there and signing up for just a couple of bucks a month to access Super's manga, as well as anything Shonen Jump related. And once again, I'm not sponsored by these guys, I just really like the service. Chapter 70, The Universe's Greatest Warrior. Or the greatest warrior in the universe so far, I think you'll find. Didn't Jackie Chun's lessons not get through to you? I mean, Goku will be more than happy to teach you, Granola. Now that we're getting somewhere quite revelationary in the world of Dragon Ball Super, why don't you start your own personal revelation with Skillshare? By using Skillshare, your skill set can be taken to new levels of greatness thanks to its massive library of classes in a wide array of fields such as literature, art, design, music, anything that you can create, Skillshare can take you further. How I'm going further this month is through Lisa Ko's course in writing fiction and how to craft a compelling plot. Lisa's class, like the vast majority on the platform, can be completed in under an hour, so you're not weighed down by days of material not knowing where to start. Here, it's quick to pick up and quick to learn. If you'd like to give Skillshare a try, check out my description and pinned comment below for the link, where the first 1,000 people who click it will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Thank you so much for listening, and let's get back to the review. And also, do let me know what field of expertise that you wish to enhance this month. When we last left off, we got a glimpse of Granola's home life, and dare I say, it wasn't all that bad. The Shigarians that live on his former homeworld are pretty nice, but our guy doesn't really want to deal with them. Instead, he got the desire to find revenge, a way to stop Frieza without the help of the heaters, and that was to go against his friend's wishes and take his Dragon Ball to make a wish on the Cerulean Dragon, named Torombo. Oh yeah, Namekians are on other worlds. Kind of a big deal, I think. As that was going on, Vegeta's whole view on the world was torn asunder by Beerus revealing his twist that he was responsible for planet Vegeta's destruction. Something that we've known for some time, but all of this was brand new to Vegeta. And this gets him onto the next phase of his training with him learning how to Hakai things, as well as other stuff that the cat uses on the regular. We start this chapter off much like how Havarok and I anticipated. On face value, Torombo, the name of the dragon, cannot grant the power of being stronger than any other being in the universe besides the bigwigs upstairs. It's all down to latent potential of the being asking the wish. Now, okay, that is something that makes sense and something that we expected. But this is where things change and this is where Torombo differs from the other two dragons that we're more accustomed to. With the likes of Porunga and Shenron, that would be the end of the matter. You can't get the wish. But Torombo has some sort of monkey's paw-like facet to him in that he can give you the wish that you want for a price, to which Granola hastily agrees to. I was a little hesitant when I saw the leaks about this chapter, but now that I've seen it in full context and in full detail, I actually like this dragon more, and it's different from the ones before him. Torombo stands out. However, we got to get back to Goku and Vegeta, after all this is Dragon Ball. Vegeta's progress with Hakai training is going… slowly. When you think he's Hakai to rock into nothing, turns out he just uses regular key. And this is where Beerus provides some more nuance into the art of Hakai for us, just like we thought he would. How it turns something into nothing, and expels energy as a result. That's how we can tell the difference between Hakai and just using plain key. Doing this with just taking a small little rock that you can hold in your hand and exploding it into a huge dust cloud that does not compute. Which is probably the most epic way of getting rid of a small rock I have ever seen. Props to you, Beerus. And it's something that the cat finds rather cool still after all this time. But the moment is soured by him burning the comic he was reading. <laughs> Come on, remember, this is Beerus, so you gotta have a little bit of humour. 
Gotta have a little bit of gag moment every now and again. But then we get to the idea of who of the two might be the strongest, given the fact they are now going into clear different paths to strength. Thank you. But then the oracle fish and Weiss allude to the notion that maybe it's not one of them. A third candidate might be in the offing for the greatest warrior in the universe, but the Saiyans right now aren't even willing to believe that chestnut, as they are so believing of their own greatness. Of course they do. It's all part of the hubris. Even Goku's doubting Whis that anyone else could be stronger. But then Vegeta demonstrates that he is the stronger one by hakaiing a pebble on his finger. And he's all like, yeah, I did it. Oh, that's so cute, Vegeta. Meanwhile, we cut back to Planet Serial, and with Granola having long hair. And I'm not gonna lie, it actually kind of suits him. Also, given the fact he now has power, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a cheeky little nod to Super Saiyan 3. That's technically the strongest a Saiyan can get without resorting to God Key to back them up. That is until Super Saiyan 4 shows up, never. However, all of this grandstanding did indeed upset Monaito, like I thought it would. And he knows all too well about the conditions that Torombo wields, and he is now more than just simply nettled. He's quite frankly terrified with how cool and brash that granola is being with all of this. He's acting like a jerk. He's being that flippant. Does... Does he really believe his own hype that much? All together now, he is the hype! But despite the fact that now, like Goku does a lot, Granola will attract the attention of stronger beings here. The bounty hunter really doesn't give two shiny hoops about that though, but Monaito does bring up a good point, and quite frankly, one of the best lines in the saga. In fact, probably in all of Super. You may be the strongest today, but you don't know who or what tomorrow will bring. That's quite deep, and I really think that's going to be a standout line for the future, as well as being a nice little modern reminder of what Master Roshi taught us. It's all about that. Remember, someone out there is stronger than you. Nice. But of course, Granola is not going to be listening to that, and instead goes off to see the heaters to get information. Cause reasons! All of this leaving Monaito with all of this turmoil and grief. Some friend you are, Granola. As Granola makes his way to the heater zone, Whis finds out about him and his deal quite quickly by using his staff. Again, thanks to the fact that angels are so mysterious, this power is easily explainable. And what makes this intriguing is that Whis openly admits that this could be a problem. And when Whis says that sort of stuff, you really need to sit up and take notice. Much like how Elec and the heaters are not doing, and what follows is the action part of this chapter, with Granola demonstrating for himself his new power by decking the majority of the gang in their respective schnozzes. Except for Gas, ironically, given the fact that those two have a little bit of a barnier with each other previously. But I'm sure that he'll get more than that later on. Possibly within actually losing his life. After many pages of acrobatics and dancing around the big oil drum, Elec calls them off and listens to what the hunter has to say. And okay, I'm sorry, this part made me laugh. At first, Granola's all like, I'm not gonna tell you how I got this power, but Elec keeps pushing him. And then on the same page, he's going, all right, I'll tell you. Ah, oh, that guy was a tough bargainer. I'm sorry, I just laughed. He's like, I'm not gonna tell you. Tell me, fine, I did it with the Dragon Balls. <laughs> However, after all of that, Elect tells Granola to go home and they'll get back to him about Freezer, but Granola can't go back home and chill thanks to his condition. He doesn't have long left to live. Instead of 150 more years left, as we now know, he's now about roughly 50, he's only got three years left thanks to Torombo, which leaves the heaters utterly horrified. That's the edge factor coming into play here. Granola's becoming an edge lord. As the heaters digest both Granola's new power, as well as their dinner, Elec tries to figure out what to do next. With this new information, on one hand, Granola could take out Freezer, and then the heaters could swoop in on a post and take Freezer's crown. But on the other hand, given the maverick nature of the hunter, and now it's become even more apparent, he could become just yet another problem that they have to deal with. And right now, it's better for Granola to die and have Freezer as a business partner. You know, it's the status quo and they've been doing pretty well under the status quo. So how are they gonna do this? The Saiyans, Goku and Vegeta. How do they know about them? Well, through 7-3, of course, this saga's exposition machine, it seems fate has brought them together. But as we will talk about in a future discussion, my friends, in this world, there is no such thing as fate. The gods are going to make this happen. And this cool visual is how the chapter ends.
All in all, this chapter was probably the weakest of all four chapters thus far, but it's still better than the average crop that we got in the last saga of the manga, for the fact that the condition on Taromba's wish was, actually, in full context, fairly reasonable. At least there was some sort of caveat to proceedings, and I don't think we would have actually gotten such nuance back in the day with only Toriyama at the helm. Also, I feel that we are seeing a level of desperation from Granola that not only is pretty intense and cool to see, but it's also sort of tragic. Does he really have that little left to live for that he's willing to decrease his life expectancy from 150 years to just three? Clearly, this has unnerved everyone from Monaito to the Heater Gang. That's a big deal. And this is one pretty good way of carrying off bravery and guts if you're willing to shorten your own life. And that's something that I think everybody alive now would strive to have more of. Life. I'm going to roll with the fact that he actually got the wish. At least there's some negative catch to it. And in normal circumstances, Torombo couldn't do the wish. It's only if you're willing to go that little extra mile you can get it. Going back to the heaters for a second, it made sense to me that they would be brought back relatively quickly. In fact, they've actually sort of been ingratiated into the story full time at the moment, what with their involvement with the Shigarians back in the previous chapter. Now, haven't I reckoned that Granola would come back and waste these goons in the future? And sure enough, he did. It just happened a lot earlier than we thought it would. In any case, it wasn't Gas that got the brunt of this. Everyone else did. Sorry, Gas, you're gonna have to wait your turn. But this put the wind up them. And now this has led to something that made me not with gusto. The way that Goku and Vegeta will discover Granola. The heaters pride themselves with knowledge. They're the boss, the king, the Shah. And they obviously use this information to their own ends and the intel they got from 7-3, sort of like the sphere from Star Trek Discovery, is the tool they now actually rely on all the time to constantly provide them with exposition as and when they need it. Oh, how do they know X and Y? Oh, 7-3 told them Z. It's genius. With Goku and Vegeta most likely being called upon by the heaters, this setup will be very organic, as well as being quite logical. Goku and Vegeta defeated Moro, and so therefore would be more than enough to be able to stop Granola at least, or better yet, get rid of him entirely. It's quite profound of Elec in a way. He knows the bounty hunter very well all too well, and realises that he will stop at nothing to end Frieza, and might even become just as big of a pest as the Freezy Pop is, getting in their way. So now the Saiyans have to be called in, and it can be used as a scapegoat. And who does Granola hate almost as much as Frieza? Saiyans. So yeah, Vegeta, you might want to get to work on your Hokai powers, because I think you're going to be using them. But having said that, I like the fact that it is now certain that Vegeta is going down a different road to Goku, especially now in the story. It's a good thing. But going back to Granola to wrap things up here, what we are seeing is something that we have been theorizing for a while. We are seeing a character, as we know him, dissolve from what he once was, just as Vegeta's character is being fortified the other way. Granola started off as a bounty hunter who was good at what he did, but lacked vision and scope. But now he has said vision, his very fiber of his being is being chipped away as we speak and being replaced with something we don't really like that much utter desire for revenge, and it will entirely eat him up, or at least what's left of him. Especially since he now only has three years to do the job, or else the Cosmos will just have him for dinner, just like they did with Miris. Speaking of three years, doesn't that sound a little bit specific to you? We are in age 781 after all, and three years on is age 784, the same time as the end of Z. Which then begs the question, will this meeting up with Granola be immediate? Or will this take its sweet time? Something that we will see nearer towards the end of the three years in age 784, that the likes of Goku and Vegeta will have to find out more over time and go on the slow path to victory. Will there be time skips? Will Granola escape all the time? Flash forwards perhaps? All for the purpose to get to age 784 and the final throes of Granola's life? Is this saga a strong indication that this saga might be the last one before a major time skip past the end of Z point? This is quite a curious feat to witness, but for now, we shall see how the next chapter's pace goes, how it blocks out the story progression. So what do you folks think of chapter 70? Did you feel that the conditions for this wish were fair, or is this the first red flag of this saga that you've seen? Let me know in the comments below, and I shall see you all next month for chapter 71. Catch you later!